The RTX 4090 launched a little over a month ago, and it felt like somewhat of a bittersweet victory. Not only did we see a huge and frankly unparalleled jump in performance, we also saw the same thing happen with the price, putting it kind of out of reach for, let's say, the average consumer. Sure, you were going to get extreme amounts of power, but even at the MSRP price, of which we only really saw briefly at launch, it was just too expensive. Luckily, today sees the launch of the 4080 16 gig, not to be confused by any other potential 40 series card with a different memory capacity. And Nvidia are now looking to offer huge gains again, but for a much more, let's say, palatable price. But before we get into that, here's a quick word from this video sponsor. Hello mate, you all right? Yeah, just got all the bits from my banging new gaming PC. Just got to put it together. It's going to be so much better than yours. Oh, right. What did you get then? The latest Intel 12th gen processor, a feature packed motherboard and 32 gig of DDR4 memory. See, miles ahead of yours. <laughs> you, you realize that board needs DDR5 memory, don't you? Don't tell me you went and bought the wrong stuff. DDR4 is so 2014. I can't believe you was that stupid. <gasps> what? No, you're joking. What should I get then? For me, I'd be looking at Corsair's newest Vengeance DDR5 kits, or if you're wanting that all important RGB, then go for the Dominator Platinum RGB. Oh, you are a lifesaver, thanks. But where can I find out more? By clicking the link in the description below, of course. <laughs> you call me the stupid one. So let's talk about the 4080. And yes, I've got five here today, including the Nvidia Founders Edition, which as a side note, is the first Nvidia branded card I've had since at least two generations ago. Now, we'll be focusing mainly on the Founders Edition in terms of sheer performance, but we'll also be comparing the other cards and the FE to each other in a small selection of games, as well as looking at the cooling performance, power, and overclocking on each card later on in this review. Now, obviously the 4080, much like its bigger brother, does utilize the latest Ada Lovelace architecture and that juicy TSMC 4N process node, by the way of the AD103 GPU, compared to the AD102 GPU used on the mammoth RTX 4090. What is interesting is now that Nvidia have moved away from Samsung for the Ampere-based cards and are now using that TSMC 4N node, now means they've managed to shrink the die size from 628 millimeters squared, which was used on everything from the RTX 3080 up to the 3090 Ti down to 379 mm squared for the 4080, which is around 39% smaller than what we saw in the AD102 GPU used for the RTX 1490. This has some huge benefits, including a higher yield, meaning stock should be a lot better than what we've already seen on the 4090, which in turn hopefully means better pricing due to supply and demand, along with the ability to include a higher transistor count compared to the predecessor products. In fact, it's so good that we're now seeing a whopping 45.9 billion transistors, which is a hefty 62% increase over the GA102 GPU used on the 3080, 3080 Ti, 3090 and 3090 Ti. Yes, the GA102 had various derivatives, but it was still the GA102 silicon, so specs were the same across the actual GPU size and transistor count. Now compared to the RTX 4090, the die size is around 62% of its size and the transistor count is around 60% of its bigger brother. But even at those numbers, it's still impressive nonetheless. And I'm still expecting some pretty huge numbers in terms of performance across the board. When looking at the main specs, it's a hard one to compare to because what do we compare the 4080 against? The 3080 10 gig and 12 gig because it is the natural successor in name or against the 3080 Ti as Nvidia claimed the 4080 to be twice as fast while using around 10% less power. On top of that, the RTX 4080 is also launching for the same $1,199 price tag that we saw the 3080 Ti launching for. So I guess that seems like, I don't know, the obvious card to focus on in our comparisons. When looking at the specs like for like, we do actually see some interesting points as the RTX 4080 actually comes in with less CUDA cores, less stream processors, less texture mapping units, tensor cores and RT cores, while the ROPS or render output units stay the same at 112. Luckily, it's not as clear cut as that as Nvidia are now claiming that their new streaming multiprocessors can offer up twice the performance and power efficiency while the new third generation RT cores claim to give up to twice the ray tracing performance, and the new fourth generation Tensor cores are touted to give up to twice the AI performance. And if history has taught us anything, it's that these jumps have been fairly significant generation to generation, and something we'll definitely be kind of putting to the test a little later on, including DLSS 3. 
especially now with more titles supporting it more than ever, and a lot more coming in the very near future. And I feel that's maybe where the 4080 is going to be completely able to outshine the previous generation cards, and of course the competition from AMD, where Nvidia have always been the leader. A couple of areas when comparing the 3080 Ti and 4080 that do differ comes down to the memory, where the 4080 now comes with 16 gig opposed to 12 gig, though it still uses the same GDDR6X memory, though it does operate at a lower 256 bit bus, giving us bandwidth of 716.8 gigabytes per second. And of course, power, which now sees the 4080 coming in with a TDP of 320 watts, so a small reduction from the 350 watt TDP of the 3080 Ti. Now due to this reduction in power and the new efficiency of the core, we're now also seeing a slight reduction in the maximum GPU temperature from 93 degrees on the 3080 Ti to 90 degrees on the 4080. Nvidia also recommend a 750 watt PSU for the FE, but obviously AIC cards with potential higher power limits may require more, so definitely keep that in mind. The other thing worth noting is that just like the 4090, it still uses the PCI Express 4.0 x16 interface, even though we do have boards that support PCIe 5.0 on the market. Even though the 40 series is stupidly fast as a whole, if the 4090 is anything to go by, we're not even close to maximizing the throughput of bandwidth of PCI Express 4 just yet, hence the decision on that one. Now in terms of the reference specs, the 4080 as standard, and therefore the Founders Edition, comes with a GPU clock of 2205MHz, a boost clock of 2505MHz, and a memory clock of 1400MHz, or 22.4 gigabit per second effective. Now I did mention that I have a total of 5 cards with me today, and while we'll be focusing on the performance of the Founders card for the majority, we will be looking at all of the cards and how they compare performance wise a little later on, alongside the performance of the coolers, thermals, power, and of course overclocking, because that's kind of where it really matters when you're looking at various models, right? So talking about each model individually, starting with the Founders, and as mentioned this is the first FE card I've had from Nvidia in a long time, so my opinion may be a bit jaded compared to others who have had a Founders card recently, but it's simply stunning to look at, and doesn't give the kind of whole gamer vibe like we're used to on AIC cards, and instead looks more kind of professional looking than anything, and it really really does work. The design really doesn't give much to talk about, as it's quite simple overall, and instead just feels like one solid block of metal, which is a big step up from the last cards I had in my hands from Nvidia. The design is split up by a sweeping X pattern across the card with a mixture of different fin densities to assist in cooling and to separate up the design. Now sticking with cooling, the card has a single 115mm fan on the front and the same at the opposite end but on the reverse of the card. Also on the reverse of the card we do find some small amounts of plastic with RTX 4080 branding which would be clearly visible once installed horizontally in your case. If installed vertically or horizontally, you're going to get a great view regardless, with a simple GeForce RTX logo that lights up white, making it easy to tie in with any system. Now the GPU isn't small by any sense of the word and comes in the same as the RTX 4090 founders at 304mm long, 137mm wide and 61mm thick, meaning that it will take up 3 slots inside your case, and the cooler doesn't actually protrude beyond that. Now it's not a light card at all, weighing in at 2435 grams, which is actually more than some of the RTX 4090s I've looked at recently, though it doesn't surprise me due to the sheer size of the block that makes up the cooler, though it's not the heaviest RTX 4080 we have here today. It also doesn't come with any form of support, but being such a solid block and the way that it's put together, I wouldn't expect it to sag anyway. The cooler is pretty crazy, and taking it apart isn't something I'd recommend, because it's almost like if you imagine what a GPU would be made like if Apple made one, and they don't want you taking it apart and repairing it, then you already have the answer. Now once you dismantle things you'll notice some pretty interesting points, like the fans that connect in by ribbon cables, and more importantly the grooved heat sinks that make contact with the memory chips. The heat sink is split and is connected by 6 heat pipes which are much fatter than what you're likely to see on other cards, though they will generally have 8 heat pipes instead of 6. Coming in at $1,199 in the US and £1,269, it's obviously priced as MSRP and will likely be the only card you see today from us that will see that price for launch. Moving on to the Gigabyte Gaming OC, and if you checked out the content we already did on the RTX 4090 Gaming OC, then this will look identical. Much like Nvidia, Gigabyte have opted to use the exact same cooler for the 4080, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. On our 4090 coverage, it did well compared to the competition in both temperatures and acoustics, 
and generally doesn't demand a huge premium over a reference price model. So I'm expecting much of the same on the 4080. For those of you unaware what this iteration of Gaming OC looks like, much like other 40 series cards, it's big, bold and pretty decent looking. I've been a big fan of the Gaming OC lineup for quite a few years as it's always a nice balance between value, features and performance. It is admittedly one of the simpler looking cards that we're looking at today, which does mean it's likely to match your system pretty well. And based on the chatter I heard with the 4090, it was one of the more popular SKUs to be snapped up by gamers. It's large, in fact, much larger than the founders from Nvidia, coming in at 342 millimeters long, 150 millimeters wide, and 75 millimeters thick. So while it takes up two slots in terms of the physical IO, it's actually larger than three slots due to the cooler. It's a fair bit lighter than the FE, weighing in at 2,285 grams, which is exactly the same as the 4090 Gaming OC as expected. And due to the size and weight, it comes with a support bracket to alleviate any sagging of the card. Cooler-wise, Gigabyte are using the same vapor chamber design that they used on the RTX 4090 Gaming OC, which isn't a bad thing, and also includes a lot of thermal pads to make contact with the memory and phases for the very best heat dissipation. Due to it being a custom model and being an OC card, it does demand a bit of a premium where we've seen the leaked micro center pricing coming in at $1,269 in the US and no official word on pricing in the UK. But you'd be expected to likely pay around £1,349 based on previous releases and how they compare. Moving on to the Inno 3D iChill X3, and this actually differs ever so slightly to the 4090 version of the same model. The cooler actually looks to share some similarities with its bigger brother, though changes things up a bit on the front of the shroud with some grey bolted on ascents instead of the glossy RGB panels that were on the 4090 version. Speaking of RGB, it still includes a panel on the top of the card which makes it visible when mounted horizontally or vertically. And in another small change up, it's actually matte now instead of glossy, which does in my opinion look a lot better. The card still remains very large, measuring in at 334mm long, 148mm wide and 62mm thick. So it does take up three slots inside your case with a cooler sitting just underneath that. It's the lightest card we have here today coming in at 2060 grams, which don't get me wrong, is still heavy, but a lot less than the other SKUs we have. Due to the weight and length of the card in O3D do include a pretty decent looking stand to hold the card into place to avoid any potential sag, which is a shame as the 4090 included a built-in bracket to aid with stability. But being a cheaper card, I get it. The cooler features a large vapor chamber design similar to what we've seen on the 4090 and includes a total of eight heat pipes to help dissipate the heat away from the core and surrounding memory chips. The heatsink is actually split into three sections with the heat pipes connecting them all together for the biggest surface area for the heat to travel to. No word on pricing on this one, but again, being a custom card and being factory overclocked, you'll likely pay a slight premium of around 200 pounds or so in the UK and in O3D have no presence in the US, so there's nothing really to comment on there. Now, if you want something different and frankly, completely bonkers in terms of style, then you have the Palette Gamerock OC, which I'll come straight out and say it, but color me impressed. I love the look of the Gamerock cards because they're bold and brash and they're not trying to hide it at all. Though the 40 series as a whole has had a bit of a redesign with the Midnight Kaleidoscope styling. Now featuring a slightly darkened crystal design simply looks stunning, but I also get that it's going to be a love hate type design. Again, it looks to use the same cooler design as the RTX 4090, though I never had a palette 4090 in my hand, so I can't, I guess, directly compare, but it's easy to see the similarities within the design. Now, speaking of the design, it is unique. I said it when they first announced the crystal style on the 30 series. And while that has improved, turning the card on is where you really get to appreciate the appearance, especially if you're a fan of RGB. Now, I won't lie and say that it's to everyone's tastes or that it will seemingly blend in with the rest of your system, as it won't, and I'm fine with that. Along with the crystal showstopper, the card features a nice mixture of materials and has some premium elements down the top and bottom that add to the rigidity of the card while also adding to the look. The card is slightly smaller than some of the competition, coming in at 329mm long, 137mm wide and 71mm thick, so it's up there I guess with the Gigabyte Gaming OC in terms of being over 3 slots thick, and weighs in at 2240 grams. So not the heaviest, but also not the lightest either. To avoid sag, much like the other cards, it does come with a support bracket to cater for any worries you may have due to its size and weight. 
Now with the cooler apart, it's easy to see that there is some extra strengthening between the cooler and the PCB. And again, another vapor chamber design. Again, featuring eight heat pipes, which flow into the cold plate, which then makes contact with both the GPU core and surrounding memory chips, which then transfers the heat away towards each end of the card. Again, no word on pricing, but based on the design and its factory overclock, you'd be expected to pay a premium over a reference spec or FE based card. Lastly, we have the MSI RTX 4080 Supreme X. As someone who uses a Supreme X card in my own system, I'm a true advocate for them because they appeal to both gamers and professionals with a premium, yet slightly gamery look. The design for the Supreme X has gotten better with every generation since its inception, and the 4080 is no different. It's a blend of materials with contrasting colors and brushed metal, and just oozes quality. Once turned on, the RGB gets to work and adds that little touch of gamery aesthetics, though it can be turned off if that's not your bag, as you know, RGB isn't for everyone. The card, much like the others, is large, coming in at 336mm long, 142mm wide, and 78mm thick. So it's actually the thickest card we have, due to that slightly angled cooler that is raised in certain sections. And along with being chunky, that's evident in the weight, as this card is the heaviest we've seen at 2,000 700 grams. Now inside the box is a stand to aid any sagging due to the sheer size and weight of the card. And based on my experience with the 30 series, they do work very, very well. Now with the card apart, you can continue to see the sheer quality of the cooler with the main heatsink not only making contact with the GPU and the memory, but also making direct contact with the VRMs as well. What difference that makes, we may look at in a VRM analysis piece of content at a later date if enough of you want to see it. Now in terms of pricing, as expected, it does come in as the most expensive we have at $1,399 in the US, while in the UK, pricing was still unclear at the time of filming. But you'd like to think based on the 4090 and how that compared, along with the US pricing, that again, you'll be looking to pay a premium over other cards. So let's talk about clock speeds, because that's another area where each card will actually differ. Now all cards obviously come with the same 2,205 MHz GPU clock, but also have come in with the same 1,400 MHz memory clock speed. So the only difference comes down to the boost clock. Now putting this in order, the FE from Nvidia comes with a boost clock of 2,505 MHz. The Gaming OC from Gigabyte improves on that slightly, coming in at 2,535 MHz. The Inno 3D iChill X3 manages to push out a little more at 2,565 MHz. The MSI Supreme X storms ahead and features a boost clock of 2,625 MHz. Then lastly, the Palette GameRock OC spots the highest boost clock here at 2,640 MHz. What that means for overclocking, we'll delve into a little later on. Now, power. Power is an interesting one, as not all of the cards are equal in that sense either. And when it comes to the reference spec of 320 watts, three of the cards conform to that, which are the FE from Nvidia, the iChill X3 from Inno 3 d and the MSI Supreme X, while the Palette and Gigabyte cards all come with a default power of 340 watts, therefore sacrificing a small amount of efficiency in exchange for some free performance. Now when looking at the max power of each card, that differs too, with the Inno 3 d card not having any adjustment to its power limit, while the Founders card gives you the ability to crank things up to 110%, resulting in a 355 watt max power level, while the Palette, Gigabyte and MSI cards all have the ability to increase the power beyond that, maxing out at 400 watts. Again, what this means for overclocking, we can find out a little later on. So that's a lot of stuff we've already gone through, but let's get into the crux of it now, the benchmarks. And for this, we've tested 15 games, and due to the fact that from our own testing, pretty clear to see that even a 4080 still has limitations with CPU bottleneck at 1080p. So therefore, we will include some 1440p data, but I want to focus heavily on the 4K resolution results because that's where it really gets interesting and allows the 4080 to come into its own. We do have data on other resolutions and we'll be sharing a lot of those kind of benchmark figures onto our Patreon, so definitely check that out if you want to absorb even more data but I will be touching on the other resolutions and how they compare as a whole later on as well. Now, all of the GPUs we tested were tested on our Intel Core i9 12900K based test system on the ASUS Z690 Maximus Hero motherboard with 32 gigabyte of Patriot Viper Venom 6200 MHz memory. Resizable bar was enabled for all GPUs and the RTX 4080 was tested on the 526.72 press driver, while all other Nvidia cards were tested on 521.90 and all AMD cards were tested on the Adrenaline 22.10.1 driver. 
We will look to update the data for all of the cards to the newer driver, but kind of as these launches go, you're not always able to test all GPUs on the latest driver in such a short space of time. It's also worth noting that we ran all of our tests on Windows 11 21 H2. So starting things off with synthetic benchmarks and in Times by Extreme, we straight away see an uplift in performance from the 3080 Ti of 27%. Though more interestingly, we see a 16% uplift in the performance compared to the 3090 Ti. So already we're off to a flying start for a card that is launching $800 cheaper than what the 3090 Ti launched for. Port Royal gives us an early indication as to what the newest generation of RT cores can do with a 30% increase in performance over the 3080 Ti and a smaller yet still very impressive leap of 17% over the 3090 Ti. Now, not everyone is looking to buy an RTX 4080 for the sake of gaming, so looking at Puget Bench for DaVinci Resolve, which is actually something important to us as it's what we use to render our videos, and we can straight away see an uplift in performance of around 7% over the last generation Ampere flagship 3090 and 3090 Ti cards. So moving on to our first game, A Plague Tale Requiem. And at 1440p, the RTX 4080 already shows its sheer performance with a 32% uplift in performance over the 3080 Ti and a 16% lead over the Ampere flagship 3090 Ti. At 4K, the gains draw a bit closer but still come in impressive with a 12% lead over the 3080 Ti and 5% faster than the 3090 Ti. In Assassin's Creed Valhalla, we find the RTX 4080 sitting with a comfortable 35% lead over the 3080 Ti and an impressive boost of over 24% compared to last generation's flagship. The 6950XT from AMD put up the biggest fight, though was still no match for the RTX 4080 that pushed forward by just under 20%. At 4K, it was a very similar story with a 34% lead over the 3080 Ti, 18% uplift over the 3090 Ti, and a 24% leap over the flagship 6950XT from AMD. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 saw some really strong numbers with the RTX 4080 coming in 38% faster than the 3080 Ti and 27% faster than the beastly 3090 Ti. The RX 6950 XT, which did come in at 137 FPS, still wasn't enough to keep up with the new ADA-based GPU that commanded a 15% lead over Team Red. At 4K, we saw similar gains of around 36% when compared to the 3080 Ti and slightly lower, but still massive gains of 22% compared to the 3090 Ti. Strangely, the 6950 XT dropped in this title, which ended up giving the 4080 a 20% lead over it. In control at 1440p, the gains just keep coming, with a 30% improvement over the 3080 Ti and around 40% in the 1% lows, giving us a much more fluid gameplay experience overall. While the 3090 Ti does offer up a slightly better FPS than the 3080 Ti, it's still not enough to get close to the new Ada Lovelace GPU, which ends up pushing 22% ahead of last generation's flagship. Then at 4K, the gain over the 3080 Ti is still exceptionally strong, coming in 26% faster overall. And we still see the 3090 Ti left in the dust as the 4080 pushes ahead by just short of 20%. Cyberpunk at 1440p clearly shows that even at a higher resolution, it's still extremely limited due to the CPU. Though the 4080 still does manage to eke out more performance that puts it 22% ahead of the 3080 Ti and 14% ahead of the 3090 Ti. 4K sees our biggest gain so far with a 40% lead over the 3080 Ti, 27% lead over the 3090 Ti and a somewhat laughable 53% push ahead of the 6950 XT from AMD. The brutality of how fast the RTX 4080 really is just keeps on coming in Death Stranding, where we find another instance of CPU bottlenecking, which is so bad that the 4090 actually performs worse than the 4080 though that doesn't stop us from seeing a 16% performance uplift over the 3080 Ti from last generation. Moving up to 4K and it's clear to see how a lot of these cards are especially tuned for 4K, as we now see the likes of the 6950XT moving towards the top of our chart, though it's still not enough to get close to the RTX 4080, which sits 7% ahead, and compared to the 3080 Ti, now comes in 24% faster at this resolution. Doom Eternal saw some results at 1440p that just had us all laughing, with the 3080 Ti getting an impressive 359 FPS, we wondered how much better the 4080 could be. And with a 39% improvement, it left us gobsmacked at over 500 frames per second. Even compared to the 6950 XT, which is no slouch in this game, the RTX 4080 makes it look inferior, coming in 19% faster overall. At 4K, the RTX 4080 just keeps on flexing, now with a 33% lead over the 3080 Ti, while the RTX 3090 Ti, with lots more memory, drew closer. 
but was still beaten by a huge 20% margin by the RTX 4080. In Dying Light 2 at 1440p, we find the 3080 Ti giving us some solid numbers, yet the RTX 4080 still manages to come in again 30% faster. And then compared to the 6950 XT from AMD, which was topping our charts, the RTX 4080 still manages to hold a strong 16% lead. It's the same story at 4K with a 16% lead over the flagship AMD card, while the 3080 Ti drops below that, giving us a 22% lead in favour of the new 4080 GPU. Now F1 has always been a game that's heavily favoured AMD, and coupling that with a CPU bottleneck at 1440p, and you can get some weird and wonderful results for both the RTX 4080 and 4090, though it does come with some pretty impressive 1% lows in relation to the average FPS. At 4K, it's business as usual where the 4080 retakes its position above the 6950 XT that was topping the charts, albeit by a 4% margin. Though the more important talking point here is the 21% improvement that we now see over the RTX 3080 Ti. Moving on to Far Cry 6 on ultra settings and generally speaking at lower resolutions, we'd notice quite a bit of CPU bottleneck. Though even with that at 1440p, we continue to see some decent gains of around 23% over the 3080 Ti with the most noticeable point coming by way of the 1% lows, which saw a huge 55% uplift in performance, so there's definitely still some form of bottleneck going on there. At 4K we see the gain increase slightly to 25% over the 3080 Ti, while the 6950 XT again fights back, but as we know Far Cry 6 does generally favour AMD GPUs over the competition, though even that isn't enough as the RTX 4080 commands an 8% lead over the AMD based 6950 XT. In Fortnite at 1440p we do see a gain of around 13% over the 3080 Ti and a smaller yet still impressive 10% lead over the 3090 Ti, but it still amazes me every time when you see such shocking 1% lows across the board. At 4K the lead further extends itself with an 18% uplift over the 3080 Ti, 16% increase over the 3090 Ti and even with the 6950 XT fighting back yet again, the 4080 is still able to hold a 7% margin over the AMD flagship. Horizon Zero Dawn is another game that generally favours AMD, and at 1440p, while the 6950 XT did give strong competition over the 3080 Ti and 3090, still wasn't enough to get close to the new RTX 4080, which comes in 22% faster. Compared to the previous generation, the real focus worth talking about here is the 3090 Ti, which gave us 216 FPS, though the 4080 coming in with an average FPS of 247 still manages to see a 14% uplift in performance. At 4K the gains improve even more, seeing the 4080 around 34% faster than the 6950 XT which dropped down the rankings along with the 4080 coming in 5% faster than the 3090 Ti, which was already ahead of the 3080 Ti by quite some margin. In Spider-Man at 1440p and being a fairly CPU intensive game we do find the 4080 dropping just below the performance of the 3090 Ti, though it does sit 8% higher in the 1% lows, lending to a better overall experience in game. Compared to the 3080 Ti, the RTX 4080 sees a small 3% gain, but again with restrictions from the CPU, it was expected in this game. At 4K those restrictions are thrown out the window where we see the RTX 4080 coming in 21% faster than the 3080 Ti, and a still impressive 32% better than the 6950 XT from AMD. Last generation's flagship 3090 Ti fares well, but even then the new Ada Lovelace GPU still manages to beat it by around 10%. Microsoft Flight Sim is one of the most heavily CPU focused games out there, and due to that at 1440p, the results are just all over the place, and is something that changes run to run due to that huge bottleneck, with the only real solution in this game being that you'd have to use a 5800X3D to ditch those bottlenecks. At the larger resolution, the RTX 4080 does see some gains, but even at 4K, a 5% lead gives us the smallest uplift in performance that we've seen over the 3080 Ti. Again, CPU bottlenecking really does come into play in this title, and it's games like this where the likes of DLSS 3 that we'll be looking at shortly should really come into play and look to completely eliminate that area of bottleneck. Finally, in Watch Dogs Legion at 1440p, we continue to see the RTX 4080 coming in 26% faster than the 3080 Ti, while still maintaining a strong lead over the 3090 Ti of 19%. Compared to the 6950 XT from AMD, the 4080 was still 10% faster at this resolution. Then at 4K we saw slightly stronger performance with a 29% lead given to the new Ada Lovelace card when compared to the 3080 Ti. Well even though the extra VRAM on the 3090 Ti did allow it to fight back, it still fell short by 18% against the RTX 4080. 
When looking at the comparative data between all the 4080 models that we had, in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 at 4K, it's easy to see that the FE with its lower clock speed does give some baseline figures that are still 34% better than the 3080 Ti, and each AIB model improves on that ever so slightly, but there really isn't much in it at all. In Cyberpunk it was very much the same story with the Founders card from Nvidia setting a precedent and all of the AIB cards coming out with 2-4% more performance, which could always be argued as margin of error. Death Stranding was very similar with one real standout card being the Inno 3D iChill X3, which commands a 5% lead over the 4080 FE, with all other cards performing slightly better due to their higher boost clocks. Then in Watch Dogs Legion, there really is nothing to report, with all models performing nigh on identically in this title. So as always, lots of data that we've been through, and some really interesting points, namely in the fact that even at 1440p, our 12900K saw some huge bottlenecks. And this is where I guess there's a huge opportunity that could open up for AMD's rumoured 7000 series 3D cache processors that are going to be coming in the near future. That aside, the RTX 4080 is clearly aimed at 4K gamers, and the performance gains at 4K were really clear to see, not only over the 3080 Ti, but in most cases over the 3090 Ti, and anything that the competition had to offer as well. What I found the most interesting is that a few titles really saw the gap narrow between the 4080 and 6950 XT, which opens up more questions about the future and what could be coming to the table from Team Red with the 7900 series, and that's something we'll definitely look at in the future. For now, with individual titles to one side, another way to look at performance is to look at the 15 game average on all of the GPUs featured. And at 1080p, even with a CPU bottleneck, the RTX 4080 still manages to sit 13% faster than the 3080 Ti and 5% ahead of the 6950 XT, but with restricted performance. While it's nice to see how things compare, it's a bit unfair regardless. Now as we move up to 1440p where a CPU bottleneck is still pretty evident in a lot of titles, we do see the gap increase between the 3080 Ti and the RTX 4080, now sitting 23% ahead of the Ampere based card. The lead over the 6950XT also increased dramatically, now being separated by 15% at 1440p. Then at 4K we see the real potential of the RTX 4080 which increases its lead over the 3080 Ti, now to a whopping 26%. It also now sits 15% faster than the 3090 Ti in the averages of all 15 titles tested, and 23% over the very best offering that AMD has right now. Right now. Now while the lower resolutions did show some pretty significant restrictions due to processor performance, and the fact that the 4080 is just, well, so fast, even at 4K, we do find ourselves with some form of bottlenecking in the likes of Microsoft Flight Sim. And while not everyone is able to buy a better processor like a 5800X3D or to wait for a new processor that, you know, doesn't exist yet, there are kind of other ways to bypass those restrictions. And that is where DLSS comes in. And the 40 series from Nvidia take that one step further too, with DLSS 3. Now for those of you who don't know, DLSS 3 is the latest upscaling technology that Nvidia are bringing to the table as a successor to the previous generations of DLSS 1, 2, 2.4 and so on. And this is now made possible by the next level in AI computing to create additional frames within game by way of the new optical flow accelerator, only found on the RTX 40 series. In addition to all of those, you know, amazing existing DLSS features like super resolution coupled with Nvidia Reflex. Now, support is still somewhat thin on the ground, but more and more titles are starting to implement it along with the likes of ray tracing for that extra level of immersion within game. Now to get an idea of what kind of performance changes we will actually get with the likes of ray tracing and DLSS, as well as DLSS 3, we tested a total of 7 titles, of which some support ray tracing, some support DLSS and some support DLSS 3, to give a kind of, I guess much clearer picture of what these features mean for your overall experience. So starting things off with a Plague Tale Requiem, where the 4080 was already 29% faster in pure rasterization compared to the 3080 Ti, and 15% faster than the 3090 Ti. When enabling DLSS in performance mode, we see that gain increase slightly to 31% over the 3080 Ti and 17% over the 3090 Ti. So some small gains to be seen comparatively like for like. Though when enabling DLSS 3, we actually see the performance on the 4080 increase by 32% compared to not having frame generation turned on with the same card. 
This also means that compared to the 3080 Ti with the older DLSS technology, we now see a huge 74% improvement on the 4080 with DLSS 3 and an equally impressive 55% improvement over the 3090 Ti with DLSS set to performance mode. In control, the RTX 4080 was already 26% ahead of the 3080 Ti and 19% ahead of the 3090 Ti, with no ray tracing or DLSS enabled, which was pretty impressive to start with. Now with ray tracing enabled, the FPS did drop significantly due to how demanding this game can be, but still saw a 16% lead over the 3080 Ti and a much smaller but still impressive 4% compared to last generation's flagship GPU. With ray tracing and DLSS enabled, the RTX 4080 shot up compared to having DLSS disabled by 93%. Though more interestingly, it now puts the 4080 with a 23% lead over the 3080 Ti and 10% lead over the 3090 Ti. So just imagine if this game had DLSS 3 as well. Now in Cyberpunk, the RTX 4080 was already dominating with a 40% lead over the 3080 Ti and 27% lead over the 3090 Ti while ray tracing saw all cards we tested taking a hammering as expected. When enabling DLSS along with ray tracing, the performance on the RTX 4080 manages to push 27% ahead of the 3080 Ti and 15% ahead of the 3090 Ti, showing that those newer RT and Tensor cores really are making a difference in comparative performance. Now enabling DLSS 3 however, just puts it into a whole different realm of performance, which sees the RTX 4080 gain another 44% of performance over the previous generation of DLSS on the same card. This also means that the RTX 4080 now pushes another 66% more frames per second compared to the 3090 Ti and 83% more than the 3080 Ti. In Destroy All Humans 2 Reprobed, which is a new game that we wanted to check DLSS 3 performance on, we again see a 13% lead in pure rasterization performance favoured to the RTX 4080 over the 3080 Ti while DLSS actually saw something very interesting, where both the 3080 Ti and 3090 Ti came in with better results, albeit by a few frames per second, so maybe you could call that margin of error. Now it's actually very similar behavior to CPU bottleneck and was extremely odd to see. Luckily, DLSS 3 comes in to save the day and sees the performance on the RTX 4080 jump up by 23% over the older version of DLSS, along with boosting performance to 21% over the 3080 Ti and 19% over the 3090 Ti. In Spider-Man, we already had a healthy lead of 21% in favour to the RTX 4080 against the 3080 Ti, and with ray tracing turned on, that lead remained stable at 28%, which is very impressive to see while enabling DLSS sees that lead shrink to just 3% over the 3080 Ti. Again, enabling DLSS 3 gives us a 50% lead on the 4080 with the previous version of DLSS, while compared to the 3080 Ti, we now see a huge 45% uplift in performance comparing each respective model's DLSS technology. Putting the 3090 Ti back in the mix and the RTX 4080 now comes in 40% faster in this game with DLSS 3 enabled. Microsoft Flight Sim was the one game that really showed how clearly evident the CPU bottleneck was, and on all cars tested we saw no difference when enabling DLSS, other than a few frames per second that could be argued as margin of error. It was only when enabling DLSS 3 on the RTX 4080 that we saw that limitation being smashed at 109 FPS. Let's just take a moment to appreciate that. Microsoft Flight Sim at 4K on Ultra doing 109 frames per second. That now puts it 87% better than the 3090 Ti with DLSS turned on. Wow. Lastly, in Watch Dogs Legion, we already see the 4080 coming in around 29% faster than the 3080 Ti and 18% faster than the 3090 Ti, while enabling ray tracing saw the FPS dip on all cards, but still saw the RTX 4080 keeping a 28% and 16% lead respectively. Enabling DLSS again sees that gain keeping consistent at 26% over the 3080 Ti and 17% over the 3090 Ti. So okay, DLSS was always impressive and has gotten better over time, while DLSS 3 just takes it one step further. I mean, before I even came into this, I expected some pretty amazing things based on you know, what Nvidia had already shown us. But you know how it can be with these canned benchmarks that brands show. And that's why it's so important that we're able to come in and kind of show you what it's really all about. Now we will be looking at DLSS 3 in a bit more detail in the near future because while it is great, I think there are I don't know, some trade-offs in terms of visual quality and smoothness. And this is something we kind of need more time to fully analyze and zoom in and actually look at the pixels. 
but we wanted to wait to see kind of more titles to grab a bigger pool of testing data. And along with that data, we kind of really want to delve into more on the quality side of things. Because while FPS is great, and in typical fashion, the higher the number is better, there's kind of, I guess, a bit more to it than that. Now, the biggest part that worries me about DLSS3 is actually on future products that can't maybe already achieve high performance to start with, because based on our experience, they kind of go hand in hand. Obviously, I'm talking about lower end 40 series cards. I guess a lot of that really comes down to the types of games you play and if you really need over 144 frames per second, compared to having a visually stunning game at a lower FPS, like 80 for instance. And along with that, to really appreciate the visuals, you're going to want a monitor that can handle it too, G-Sync enabled. But as I mentioned, that's something for the future content, so make sure you don't miss out on that. Now one other area, kind of performance to one side, is cost per frame during rasterization. And it's a bit of a tricky one to call because we're basing the RTX 4080 on its MSRP price because it's not currently for sale. While the other cards we're comparing against is what they're actually selling for right now. Obviously this is the only kind of accurate way that we can do it considering the 4080 at the time of making this content, yeah, isn't out. So we don't have that data. What we do find is that at 1080p in the US, the RTX 4080 actually offers up a very attractive value for money perspective compared to the other cards, though the 6950XT still offers far better value when comparing them head to head, and then obviously the 6900XT even better. At 1440p, it's very much a similar story with AMD offering up the better value argument, though it's still not bad for a card that is the newest kid on the block in terms of tech and features. Finally, at 4K, we again see the RTX 4080 offering some amazing performance for the money, though it's still not enough to compete with AMD, though that is now technically classed as, I guess, old tech. Now, a couple of other things to go through comes down to the cooling performance on each of the models we have here, where we see after an hour loop of F122 that the MSI Supreme X model comes in with the coolest GPU and hotspot temperatures at 60 and 71 degrees respectively when compared to the other cards with the Inno 3D actually coming in at the hottest, but still within kind of safe parameters. One area that the Inno 3D did fairly well on was the memory temperature at 60 degrees along with the FE from Nvidia, though the Gigabyte stole the show here slightly at 58 degrees max. Now it's not all praise though, as the Gigabyte card did see the fan spin up to just over 1700 RPM during the hour loop, while the FE card actually came in the lowest at just over 1300 RPM, followed by the Inno 3D iChill card. Now when it comes to audible noise, the MSI came in the best at 40 decibels, followed closely by the Inno 3D and palette cards at 42 decibels. The Nvidia FE card was a little louder at 43, and sadly due to the fan spinning so fast, the Gigabyte Gaming OC was the loudest 4080 we had at 49 decibels. Looking at overclocking each card and running it through the same one hour loop of F122 for stability saw some very varying results card to card. Obviously, some of this comes down to the power limits that we spoke about earlier, coupled with cooling solutions, and of course, the quality of VRMs used on each individual card. Now, for some part of it, you could argue that the silicon lottery comes into play, but in 2022, this doesn't make as much of a difference card to card, unless you're going for a card that is known to have been silicon. So again, booting up F122 for an hour and seeing what kind of figures we were able to achieve. And due to the Inno 3D card not having any adjustable power limit, we saw very similar figures to what we had at stock. While the FE card from Nvidia saw the temperature rise across the board, with the most noticeable being the hotspot increasing from 75 degrees to 79, while the memory also increased from 60 degrees to 72, though the fan speed only increased slightly by around 3%, which made hardly any difference to the acoustics. The palette saw some of the least increases in temperature, only seeing the GPU increase by 1 degree, the hotspot by 3 degrees, and the memory by 2 degrees, though the fan speed did increase by 10%, but this only made a one decibel difference to the audio. Also, both the MSI and Gigabyte cards managed to keep things under control with some pretty small gains in temperatures when overclocked, but the MSI did see the largest jump in fan speed from 1434 RPM up to 1771 RPM, which is a whopping 23% increase, which also increased the audible noise from 40 decibels up to 48. So I think this is a record for the most comprehensive review of a graphics card that we've ever done. And I'll firstly apologize for the sheer length of it because I just kept adding to it as there was so much to cover. So hopefully it's appreciated. I'll try and keep this part though short and sweet because I think the performance speaks for itself. 
the RTX 4080 is a beast. But the price I know just does, doesn't sit right with most consumers who argue that it's out of reach for the average gamer. But I want to make one thing clear. The 4080 and 4090 aren't for the average gamer. They truly are next level performance. And that's so clear to see when you look at lower resolution performance, which just ends up bottlenecked by the current lineup of CPUs. Sure, we could have used the 5800X3D, which would have seen huge performance gains in some titles, but the 12900K that we used still beats it in other titles. I guess now, more than ever, we need next level CPUs in terms of 3D cache on the Ryzen 7000 series. Until then, DLSS 3 really does make up the difference and frankly shocked me in certain titles like Cyberpunk and Spider-Man. And from a first glance, looks absolutely gorgeous. But as I said, I do want to drill down further into that in the near future. So keep your eyes peeled for that. Now, when it comes to each model, including the FE from Nvidia, I think there's an argument for all of them. Style, overclocking, cooling, performance, acoustics, temperatures, they all have their strong points. But I fear, much like the RTX 4090 launch, you may be restricted to what's available. But hopefully I'm wrong and things are better. I mean, the die size is smaller, so yield should be better, so stock should be better, so who knows? Fingers crossed. But hopefully this video has given you an idea as to what you should expect and what options you have. The big question is, are you going to buy one? I'm intrigued to know because as you saw, it actually comes in fairly competitive when looking at the cost per frame of retail prices at the moment, especially at 4K, which is pretty impressive considering you'll always be expected to pay an earlier adopter's kind of tax with any new technology. Though older cards have seen a bit of a rise in price again lately. So I'll let you do your own sums to see if you think it's worth it. For me, yeah, I love the 40 series. It's the first generation of GPUs that has genuinely got me excited about graphics cards again. And while the 4090 was just a beast, the 4080 still has the same essence as it, but for a lower price, hopefully. I just hope that supply and demand isn't an issue and that we do see it for $1,200 or just under £1,300 in the UK. Though I do worry, at least for pure rasterization, what have AMD got up their sleeves? I guess we'll have to wait a little longer to see what happens on that front and who comes out victorious. For now though, what do we think of the RTX 4080? Perfect? Or does the price need to just come down that little bit? I'd love to see what you guys and girls think. Apologies for the long video, but hopefully you see the worth in it. If you did, a like and a sub to the channel would be amazing. And if you love what we do, then consider supporting us over on Patreon, where you'll get a ton of exclusive features like all of the charts for these cards, as well as uh, other exclusive features like behind the scenes content, access to our bi-weekly game night and a super special area over on our Discord. The link for all that is down below. Thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye.